to the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement twice. They voted against. While the conservative leader is busy taking talking points from Fox News and Donald Trump on this side of the House, we support Ukraine. He's not there for Ukraine, he's there for himself. When conservatives demanded that the government provide lethal weapons before Putin's invasion, when they most needed them, he said no. One last spicy prime minister's question period for 2023 as the prime minister and Tory leader Pierre Polyev face off. That back and forth is happening against the backdrop of a potential shift in public opinion. After months of steady increases in support, have the Tories hit a fork in the road? The latest data from an abacus poll conducted over the last week shows the conservative lead is down by five points and the liberals are up by four. Tories do still have a 10 point lead over the liberals at 37 percent to the liberals 27 percent. That's the most dramatic shift, but it's not the only one. Take a look at this graphic as well. The latest Nanos polling also shows the Liberals gaining a little support up from a virtual tie with the NDP back in November. Joining us now to unpack those numbers, David Coletto is the CEO of Abacus Data and Shachi Curl is the president of the Angus Reid Institute. Hi, everybody. Great to have you both with us tonight. Uh, David, let me start with you in, in this specific poll because there's going to be, I think, a number of political watchers who will rightly point out it's one poll, a moment in time. We don't know yet if it's going to be the start of, of a different trend. But what does your gut tell you about the significance of these numbers? Well, I think that the size of the movement um, is indicating to me that something's happened in the last few weeks that has the Conservatives down five and the Liberals up four. Right? It, I, I went back... And there hasn't been a moment in years in which, over the course of two weeks, that kind of shift has happened. And I went and I looked and I made sure this isn't you know, a problem with the data or something else happening. There's a corresponding increase in Mr. Polyev's negatives, though. So it's telling me that it's likely that this is a reaction to something the Conservatives have been doing over the last two weeks, as opposed to the Liberals gaining new fans. Because the Prime Minister's numbers, the government's approval rating, and the general mood of the country hasn't changed all that much in two months, uh, in two weeks. So it's really about um, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's the filibustering, you name it, something the Conservatives are doing are pushing voters who want change but aren't convinced there's an alternative back to the Liberals. I know, Shachi, you're going to have some new numbers on this coming up soon as well with Ingus Reid. What is your sense of that faction of, of people, of voters that David's talking about that are kind of sick of the current government or have an appetite for change, but aren't wholly convinced of parking their vote with the official opposition? Uh, so it's it's not just about parking vote, but it's also locking in or committing to vote. And I think David's numbers do start to outline and, and understand for us, which we're going to get much more deeply into uh, in hours from now, around just how soft a lot of the wide vote is. So even among decided and leaning voters, the number of people who say, look, I, I could change my mind. It is not beyond the realm of possibility that I could uh, either move move back to the Liberals if I'm a Liberal who's who's now looking seriously at the Conservatives, or I could move to the Conservatives even if I'm going to stick with the Liberals, and of course the NDP's in that mix too. The size of that unlocked, uh, slightly soft, uncommitted universe is huge. It represents about half the electorate overall uh, who say at this stage that they are decided. So that's it, to say nothing of the undecided at this point. And it just shows us how dynamic and how volatile the electorate is. And I think we can be, uh, we should expect to, and we can be prone to these kinds of shifts where uh, the Conservatives have objectively, and it's been much much written about and talked about, including in my columns in the Ottawa Citizen, uh, just how, how crappy a couple of last weeks the Conservatives have had. And as a result, uh, just the extent to which people are still below the surface, really feeling the push and pull and the tension of, of really where to lock their vote and whether they're prepared to lock their vote. What's your sense, David, of the softness collectively of Vote, decisiveness around where to park your vote, where Canadians want to park their vote at this point? Well, I think it's, it's I, I agree with Sachi. I think it's entirely soft, uh, in, in part because I think a lot of the reaction voters have had to political events has usually, is almost entirely a reaction to the Liberal government, right? So over the last year, we've seen 
Minister Trudeau's numbers get, get bad. We've seen the government's approval rating continue to deteriorate. The result has been people are looking for an alternative, and so it's easy for them to go and say, well, okay, I'm going to vote Conservative if I get that chance. Um, but what they haven't really given a lot of thought to is what is a Conservative government going to do? And that usually doesn't happen until an election, when that choice is very clear for voters. So I do agree, we're going to see likely some volatility. What's clear is people want to change. I think what's less clear is whether they feel that the change that's on offer, particularly Mr. Polyev and the Conservatives, is acceptable to them. And so I've been arguing you know, in, in my commentary that it's not sufficient for the Conservatives to just hammer away at the Liberals and remind voters why they want change. They still have to do the work, and they've got time to do it, to prove to them that they're ready for government. I think what's, what's also happened, Shachi, and I'd love to get your perspective, in the last, let's say, two to four weeks, and, and you alluded to this, is that in the, the absence of filling that information themselves, the, the Liberals have, have filled the vacuum, right? They have, they have you know, aided and embedded at times by, for example, the, the vote on Ukraine, but they have said, here's what the Conservatives will do. They'd vote against Ukraine. They would vote against all these things that, you know, dental care, et cetera, et cetera. Like they're, now you may disagree with the merits of that, people listening, but, but they're filling the vacuum to cr try and characterize what a Conservative government would do. And, and this poll leads me to believe that that's having an impact. And part of the reason, I think, and I'm speculating a little bit here, I, I'm not in the heads of conservative strategists, but what we know from the data that we're going to be releasing is the tightrope that the conservatives have to walk in order to keep their base on side, as well as attract swing voters who are right now in a very soft place saying, I'm not ruling the conservatives out or I'm looking hard at the conservatives, but I still might go back to the liberals if I don't like what I don't hear, probably leads the conservatives to a place right now where they they may feel that the better bet, the better part of valor politically for them is to say as little as possible rather than being caught or trapped in a policy a statement or in a, in a campaign promise that comes too soon that starts to uh, either push some of those swing voters away or pull other swing voters away. What's fascinating, really, is that the dynamics around this, and David talks about the desire for change, is you have past NDP voters who are now looking softly at the Conservatives. You have past Liberal voters, as we know, who are looking softly at the Conservatives. And depending on what comes out of the opposition leader's mouth on a lot of policies, in some cases that may attract NDP voters and repel Liberals, or vice versa, or risk putting the Conservatives offside with their own committed base. So this, this starts to get really, really tricky, and sometimes the better thing to do politically is just don't say anything at all. I just have time for one last question. I wanted to ask for your uh, perspective, David, on what you'll be looking for now going forward to isolate whether or not this is just, you know, an outlier or it ends up being something more. Well, I'm excited to see Sachi's numbers in a few hours um, and to see other pollsters <laughs> to see whether this kind of trend yeah, continues. Sure. Um, but I also think, you know, you watched Question Period yesterday. You showed a clip. There was a little more excitement and energy on the Liberal side of, of the House. And I think they have found some issues that have, yes, you know, what's going on in the Middle East may have divided some parts of that caucus, but other issues like Ukraine and, and, and feeling um, ready to take on Polyev has given them, I think, a little bit more of an edge um, to push back and to do the things that Sachi said they have to do, which is define in people's minds what a Conservative government would be. Uh, we released some other numbers on my, on my Twitter feed today that shows um, on a, most of the things that, that the Conservatives may or may not do if they're elected, there hasn't been a big move since May in people's minds. But on the things they focus the most on, cutting the, getting rid of the carbon tax and making housing more affordable, um, more Canadians now think they will do those things than did in May. So the lesson here is if they stay focused on the things people want them to, um, they lead by 19 points in the, in the polls. If they start to talk about things people don't care about or wonder why they're even talking about, I think you get to a place where they're only 10 points ahead. Very interesting. Lots to talk about in the new year, I imagine. Thank you so much to both of you. Shachi Curl, the president of the Angus Reid Institute, and David Coletto, the CEO of Abacus.